Hi everyone, it's Liam here from A Shot of Wildlife. And I'm very excited at the moment because I'm about to go on a well overdue mini wildlife adventure. Let's get going. For today's video, I took four hours to travel 80 miles west into the county of Lincolnshire. And after a slightly longer than expected drive, I finally made it to my base for the next couple of days. And I've always wanted to do this. I stayed at Windmill Farm Caravan Park, which is perfectly placed out in the fens, giving me access to the countryside and to the wildlife that I would hopefully find there. Well, now that I've done all my chores, let's go and see if we can find some actual wildlife. The first place I visited was a two minute walk from the campsite, Baston Fen Nature Reserve. It's managed by Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust and is a long stretch of land between the River Glen and a strip of wet fen and wet woodland. As beautiful as it was, I'm not just here for the scenery, and the wildlife was playing a bit hard to get. Well, I don't want to count my pigeons before they flap, but so far, I haven't seen anything except pigeons here. And all the ones I have seen have been flying away, so I haven't even got them on film. Um, I don't know, maybe as the sun goes down a little bit more, some more things will come out, or maybe I'll just have to wait till tomorrow before I see some real wildlife. Either way, it's still a beautiful evening to be outside. <sighs> and then finally, I spotted something alive and not flying off into the distance. A pair of mute swans. These are the UK's heaviest bird, sometimes growing up to 14 kilos in weight and although they are quite common, they are still handsome birds. You can tell that this is an adult pair from how orange their beaks are, but the fact that they haven't got any signets with them means that they must not have been successful at nesting this year. On the other side of the path, in a small ditch, I spotted another white bird, a little egret. For a while, I've been describing these as newcomers to the UK, but these days, I see them pretty much every time I'm outside and they have definitely set up home here. This one was kicking its bright yellow feet through the water, hoping to expose any small creatures for it to eat. It spotted me and made like a pigeon, up and away into the evening sky. Further down the track there was a large herd of cattle, thankfully separated from me by a fence and a ditch. I've got a bit of a phobia of cows, and there's no way, with the presence of young calves and this rather unthreatening white bull, that I'd have been able to walk through them. However, up ahead, there wasn't a fence or a ditch to protect me. But luckily, I'd reached the far end of the reserve, and it was time to turn back and head for the campsite. The swans and the egret were now long gone, but down among the heavily weeded and almost devoid of water ditch, I spotted a couple of juvenile moorhens. Like many wading birds, moorhens are quite independent from a young age, and their parents were nowhere to be seen. Or perhaps they had already seen the nearby danger and were hiding away. And just after filming them moorhen chicks, I saw a dark mammal dash into the reeds. So I stood there waiting for about 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Um, but now I've waited too long, the sun's going down and I think I'm gonna have to walk back some of the way in the dark. It's time to get a stomp on. I'm pretty confident the dark mammal I'd seen was a non-native American mink. 
They are quite common in the Fenlands of Lincolnshire and a moorhen would definitely be on their menu. Up ahead I got to film something I've been trying to film for quite a while, a hunting kestrel. Admittedly, I won't be winning any awards for this footage, but it's amazing to see how still the bird stays whilst its wings move so quickly. Kestrels don't hover properly, but instead they fly into the wind at exactly the same speed as the wind is coming towards them. This allows them to look out for any mammals, lizards or other small creatures below. The kestrel left and so did I, through a small woodland and back towards the campsite. On the way, I was treated to the sight of a more successful swan family with their three well-grown cygnets and I couldn't help but stand and watch the local rabbits as they tried to figure me out. Rabbit numbers have dropped by more than 40% in the UK in the last 10 years, so it's nice to see them doing well here. And after 30 seconds of road walking, I was back to the campsite. And although the sun's gone down, I've finally made it back to my tent. It isn't too dark, so I'm gonna sit here Drink a couple of um, fermented barley, yeast, sugar and water. I think that's the ingredients. Um, and then if there's some stars, I'll show you them. But if not, I'll um, see you nice and early in the morning. Well, good morning campers. I've got a whisper because I'm pretty sure I'm the first person up on this campsite. Um, no meter shower last night, but it was still a beautiful night to sit outside and um, have a couple of beverages. Uh, the plan for today is to go to RSPB Frampton Marsh. It's going to be really, really good for um, for birds. So yeah, it's about 20 miles from here. Let's get cracking. Come on. As I loaded the car. I caught a brief sighting of a greenfinch, and then I noticed this juvenile green woodpecker. It didn't seem to be up to much, so once I was ready, I set off, travelling 20 miles northeast to RSPB Frampton Marsh. Well, I've just made it to RSPB Frampton, and straight away I know I've made the right decision coming here. I mean, I'm literally I'm in the car park right now. And just here in this field next to it, there's loads of stuff. So there's a couple of lapwings, a lapwing there, a lapwing there. I mean, there's some linnets chasing each other there. There's a grey wagtail. I'm not even sure what that small bird is. I'll have to take a closer look in a moment. Um, another lapwing, another lapwing. There's loads going on. And that's just the field next to the car park. I'm going to get my proper camera out and start taking a real closer look at some of these things. It's going to be a really good day. The fence line between the car park and the field seemed to make a great resting place for a charm of goldfinches. This flock was mainly youngsters and many still seemed to be reliant on their parents for food. Here, the adult with its red and black markings diligently delivers food to one of its chicks. Most of the other birds had moved away by now, but this young lapwing, with its short crust of head feathers, was still nearby, but only for a minute and then it too was off. I headed into the reserve proper, but it didn't take long before nature stopped me again. I don't even, I don't even know what to say, I mean, the car park's, the car park's there. I've walked maybe maybe 100 metres and I've already seen so many different things. Like just look here, I don't know if you can really see on the GoPro, but this it's just birds, 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 birds. There's some gobwits out there, some red shank, lots of like, um, lots of ducks. I did see a spoonbill fly over. I'm pretty sure I'm gonna get better views of spoonbills later on. Oh, it's 
absolutely just fantastic. Oh. There are two species of goblet in the UK, the black-tailed and the bar-tailed. I'm pretty sure the closer bird here, with its slightly upcurved beak, is a bar-tailed godwit. As I stood there, a skein of geese landed on the far side of the pool and it brought my attention to a small bird hurrying along the shoreline. This is a little ring plover. These tiny birds first bred in the UK in 1938 and have gradually colonised a lot of the country with around 1,250 pairs now breeding here. Out on the water was a solo barnacle goose. It didn't have a ring, so it's impossible to tell if it's a true wild bird, although the chances are it's an escapee. The white bird in the distance here is a spoonbill, but you'll see why I didn't include much footage of that a little bit later in this video. As I carried on towards the first hide, I passed by this interesting art installation and a group of young grey herons. Five would be a very big clutch for one nest, but it's not impossible, especially if there's a lot of food around for them. I've probably been here for about 15 minutes now, and I've already seen so many cool things. The spoonbills, the family of herons, the, um, the godwits, and loads of other stuff. I haven't even made it to the first hide. I'm about to go in there now, but apparently a rare bird has been seen from there, so it might be quite busy. Let's see. The rare bird was a white rumped sandpiper. Can you guess which direction it was in? I couldn't see it from where I was standing, although it probably was out there among thousands of other waders. The taller birds here are godwits, and the smaller birds are dunlin. Apparently, a white rump sandpiper is very similar in size to a dunlin, so I really had no chance of separating it from the flock. Further out there are three little egrets standing around on a scrape. They are members of the heron family and first bred in the UK in 1996, but now they are fairly common. I can't find a recent estimate for their current populations, but in 2017 there are around 12,000 of them here and their numbers have definitely increased since then. They weren't the only white birds I could see from the hide either. There was a spoonbill in the shallows feeding. See how it sweeps its spatulate bill from side to side, stopping occasionally to swallow any invertebrates, crustaceans or fish that it managed to snare. Out in the pool there was another bird with a specially adapted beak feeding away, an avocet. They have upturned bills which they also swish through the water hoping to catch small creatures. I don't know for sure but I imagine that this allows them to cover a larger area closer to the sediment where more prey is likely to be. Closer into the hide there was a larger group of little ring plover. Notice how they peck, walk and pause, hoping to grab flies or invertebrates as they go. From what I've seen online, this reserve is massive, so I'm going to take a walk around, pop into the rest of the hides, probably see loads of other cool stuff, um, and then come back to this one later. Unfortunately, although it's great all them people have come to see this rare bird, the rare bird also happens to be the same side of the hide as all the rest of the stuff which I'm interested in. Um, so hopefully a little bit later on it'll be a little bit quieter, and I'll be able to have a proper look out of that side as well. A large chunk of the reserve was surrounded by predator fencing to stop badgers, foxes, otters or other terrestrial animals from getting in and eating the wading birds, but as I came to the next hide there were signs of a threat that no fence could save the birds from. I've heard a lot about it in the news this year but bird flu was pretty bad on the east coast of England 
and I think I've just seen my first case of in the flesh an animal with bird flu. Unfortunately there isn't very much you can do, there are signs around saying that the wardens are coming to collect any sick or injured birds once a week, but apart from that there's no sort of cure for them, especially in the wild. I just hope that in time the bird populations that have declined because of it this year um, eventually recover. Yeah. Of course, I couldn't be certain that it was bird flu that was affecting this grey lag goose, but it was definitely unwell and its outlook didn't look too good. On a more happy note, there were plenty of healthy looking birds in front of this hide, including a couple of fluffed up little grebes. They're excellent divers, and after a few glimpses, they gave me the slip. There were some avocets here too, and this youngster had caught itself some dinner, although it seemed to be struggling to get the fish from the floor to its throat. The prey here was a free spine stickleback, and after a few minutes, it either got away or the bird gave up trying to swallow it and joined an adult for some rest. It turns out it hadn't quite mastered the art of sitting down yet either. Further out, and there were some little egrets here too. Their long head plumes made them a target for Victorian hat makers, and these feathers used to be smuggled into the UK in their thousands. I moved on towards the next hide, passing by another art installation, and wondered if I would be lucky enough to see any of these birds in the flesh on my visit. At this part of the reserve, the breeze is coming right off the sea and phew, I tell you, it smells like a seafood shop, it's proper crabby. Um, but I think if I go up here, up these stairs, I might actually be able to see the North Sea or at least the wash, which is I guess a part of the North Sea. I was right, at the top of the stairs I was awarded a view out across the wash with one of the largest examples of salt marsh habitat in the world. I stood for a few minutes, taking in the view and the sea air, and without thinking about the cattle that could be on the other side of that fence, I turned and headed back towards the actual reserve and to the next hide. Maybe it was something I said, because when I got here, there was loads of people in this hide, but now, as you can see, it's completely empty. But I don't mind, just me, the spoonbills, and all the other waders, look at that view. Oh. It's not even midday. Yeah, I gave the game away a bit there, as outside in front of this hide, I had the best views of spoonbills that I have ever had. And there were plenty of them to look at. At one point, I counted 32, which is amazing considering they hadn't nested in the UK for more than 300 years until 2010, when a small colony formed in North Norfolk. Since then, they have gradually increased in numbers as both a breeding and overwintering bird, and I'm very happy about that. Just look how beautiful they are. A bird of prey flew over, out of the view of my camera, and flushed them into the air. So it was about time that I started paying attention to some of the other birds on the water and the scrapes. There was plenty to choose from. These are a mix of black-tailed and bar-tailed gobwits, and to be honest, trying to explain the differences between them from this view at this time of the year isn't easy. The main difference is the length and curvature of their bills. 
Black-tailed gobwits have longer and straighter bills, whilst bar-tailed gobwits have shorter and slightly upcurved ones. These three, for example, are black-tailed gobwits in winter plumage. Among the other birds, there was also a lapwing and a ruff close in. These birds have a very varied plumage throughout the year, especially the males, which usually develop large plumes of colourful feathers around their heads and necks in the breeding season. This bird is probably a female, although there is a chance that it is a drably coloured male. The grey lag geese I could see from this hide all looked quite healthy, and alongside the large numbers of avocets and gobwits, I thought I'd show you this juvenile moorhen. This one will hopefully eventually grow into its feet. And don't worry, I did manage to film the white rump sandpiper. Can you spot it? Neither could I, but I was assured it was out there somewhere. It was time to move on. I headed back towards the centre of the reserve, but as I hadn't been there before, I took a different route to the one I'd came down, but it turns out this wasn't the most wildlife friendly. I did pass by a couple of raised viewing areas for some shallow pools, but there wasn't anything new I hadn't already shown you, so I didn't stop to film. I also passed another cool art installation. I'd love to have a wall painted like this at home. And soon, I ended up back at the car park. I've just made it back to the car. I'm absolutely starving and I didn't really bring any food with me. So I'm gonna drive into the nearest town, well, to the nearest shop, get some food and then think about where to go next. I may end up back here depending on what's nearby, but also it'd be cool to find somewhere new and see some other interesting wildlife. From Frampton, I headed about four miles north through the town of Boston and to a big change of scenery. I'm back full of food and caffeine, so I've picked a place on a map, this place here, Witham Way Country Park. Never been here before, never heard of it. I have no idea what I'm going to see, but hopefully there'll be some wildlife about. And if not, it's still gonna be a lovely afternoon walk. At first, there wasn't much wildlife on show, but I did have a chance to practice my all-terrain camera carrying skills. Yep, still got it. I then spotted one of the UK's favourite birds, a European robin, sheltering in the shade, and this wood pigeon, who didn't seem to be up to very much at all. And then I got a bad view of this juvenile green woodpecker. I could tell it was a youngster from the mottling of the green on its sides and back, and because it didn't have the dark face markings of an adult. Further into the park I passed by a bunch of buddleia. These non-natives are also known as butterfly bushes and it's easy to see why. They were swarming with large and small white butterflies. These are both common species but there was a rarity amongst them, my first ever hummingbird hawk moth. Although they don't really have the colourings of a hummingbird, they do share the ability to hover in place and bounce from flower to flower in search of nectar. They can't survive the winter in Britain, but can be seen here from May until the end of September, and there have been quite a few about this year. So if you're watching this video soon after it came out, I recommend stopping for five minutes the next time you pass a buddleia and seeing if you can spot one for yourself. The next part of the route took me along the river Witham, and soon I was almost back to where I'd started. I've just finished doing a lap of the country park, and for quite a small space near to the town centre, there's loads of wildlife here. I mean, it is 32 degrees, so it's amazing that I've seen anything. Now I'm going to head back to the car, and then I'm going to go back near to the campsite, I think. There's a, a woods nearby and I might pop in there 
and see if I can find even more wildlife to show you. God, I am the gift that keeps on giving, aren't I? On the way back to the car, I passed this grey squirrel who seemed to be struggling a bit in the heat. Having a fluffy tail isn't really a good way of staying cool. It looked as if it was trying to get its body as close to the roots of the tree as possible. I guess these were a bit cooler than the surrounding area. Opposite where I'd parked the car, I spotted this rather scraggly looking magpie trying to find some food in the parched ground. It seemed to be missing a patch of feathers on the back of its head, which is a sign that it might be getting picked on by other magpies, or perhaps it had recently had a close call with a predator. There are a couple of green woodpeckers here too. This one has the dark moustache and clear markings of an adult, and nearby was a juvenile, probably one of its chicks from earlier this year. I made the trip back to near the campsite, but not to the reserve I had intended to visit. There's been a bit of a change of plan. Unfortunately, the woods I was trying to go to, a place called Dole Woods, is on Google Maps as a nature reserve, but unfortunately it's completely closed off and you can't get in there. So either I went to the wrong place or they've recently closed it. Anyway, so I've come to a different nature reserve called Furby Fen Slipe. I think I got that right. Um, it's Lincolnshire Wildlife Trust and it's meant to be a wet fen and wet woodland. Um, and I'm gonna see if there's anything about. If there isn't, I'm only two minutes from the campsite, so I might just go back and perhaps have a relaxing evening. I wasn't very hopeful for Furlby Fen Slope. The path was overgrown and it didn't look like many people have visited recently. After a short walk, I hadn't seen any signs of wildlife so I made a decision. I'm calling it a day, I think, at least for this nature reserve. I'm gonna go back to the farm now, perhaps relax for an hour or two, um, and then wait until this evening and then take a walk around the farm and see what sort of wildlife's hanging around there, I guess. Um, yeah, it's about 31 degrees, 30 degrees, something like that at the moment. And I think any wildlife that is here it's just, just sort of hiding up. Back at the farm, one of the neighbouring fields had been harvested, so some of the local pheasants had came to see if anything had been left for them. These were youngsters and were being followed by an adult female. I think they have likely been born in the wild rather than released for shooting. Pheasants are omnivores and will eat everything from grain, seeds and peas to insects, small mammals and reptiles. Closer to my tent, under a bush, was this female chaffinch and a well-rounded wood pigeon. They were either sheltering from the heat or perhaps they had spotted the danger overhead. A buzzard. These are the most common and widespread birds of prey in the UK and one would happily take a pigeon or a chaffinch as a snack. Some of the campsite's residents seemed either oblivious or unafraid of the danger, pied wagtails. I only filmed two of them, but at one point there was eight of these busy little birds flicking their tails across the grass in search of something to eat. They mainly eat invertebrates, but can, and do, take scraps from people on occasion. Well, it's been a really relaxed evening here at the campsite. I had a shower, made some food, and now I'm gonna sit back, relax, and enjoy what I can see of the sunset through the bushes over there. Um, if I do see any more wildlife, or if there is a meteor shower tonight, I'll show you that after I finish talking. And if not, the next time you'll see me will be tomorrow morning when I take you to another Lincolnshire nature reserve. The only wildlife I saw after this point was a female monk jack in the field where the pheasants had been. My tripod was busy filming a time lapse, 
so sorry about the shakiness of this footage. The campsite manager told me that they have a healthy population of monk jack, roe deer and brown hares in the area. In real life the sunset looked much better than this, but as I made the effort to film a time lapse, I thought I may as well include it. Good morning. I had um, a fantastic night's sleep, which is quite surprising given that the inflatable mattress unsurprisingly deflated overnight. I'm going to um, load the car up now and go to the final nature reserve of this trip. I think it's called Deeping Lakes, but if I've got that wrong, I'll put the proper name across the screen now. Let's get going. Deeping Lakes was about five miles south of the campsite, just on the border between Lincolnshire and Cambridgeshire. I've just arrived at Deeping Lakes and I've had a look at a map of the site. I've never been here before, as the rest of the reserves I've visited on this trip. Um, and it looks like there's sort of a circular route and then a little path where you can go up and then come back on yourself to get to the car park. Um, lots of lakes here, so I'm expecting to see quite a few wet, wetland birds um, and maybe something else when I get looking around. As I came to the first viewing area, a lot of the wildlife seemed to be quite far away. There were several swans and a lone lapwing. Out on the water were three other birds that I haven't yet mentioned in this video, tufted ducks. These have bright yellow eyes and adult males have a plume of feathers from the back of their head which is where they get their name. They spend a lot of their time on or diving below the water surface and this means it's very important to keep their feathers clean and in good insulating condition. This bird on the left was giving itself a real good preen. I wonder if birds get dizzy. Closer into the viewing platform the sky was busy with dragonflies. I think these are emperor dragonflies but if I'm honest my dragonfly knowledge isn't brilliant. These would be patrolling the edge of the water in search of potential mates and airborne insects to catch and eat. I carried on to the first and only proper hide of the reserve. I think that nature should be accessible for everyone, so it was great to see a lifting seat in the hide which gives wheelchair users an equal opportunity to enjoy the wildlife. Well, I'm the only person at the only hide on this nature reserve, and I don't know why. It's lovely and cool in here, and the view is amazing. In front of the hide, the main focal point was an island, which had been claimed by several species of birds. There were a couple of little egrets down near the water, keeping their white plumage pristine, and further up was a colony of cormorants. See how these birds are wobbling their throats? This is called gular fluttering and is the bird's way of keeping cool. There were still a few occupied cormorant nests, one of them with these well-grown youngsters pretty much ready to fledge. And here the two birds on the right had just left the nest but weren't quite ready to take to the air. At the top of one of the island's trees, there is a platform that's been put up with the hope of attracting ospreys, but so far it hasn't been successful. This pair of great black back gulls don't mind though, for them it is the perfect nesting spot. Out on the water there weren't many birds, but one species that did stand out was the potchards. These are all males, with their chestnut heads and grey backs. Females are more drab in colour and lack the distinct markings. And here's a coot. I carried on around the reserve and after passing by a small wood I came onto the north bank of the River Welland.
On the other side of this river is Cambridgeshire, a place close to my heart and where I will visit for a wildlife adventure in the near future. Just down to my right is the River Welland. Now it looks really, really shallow. And if I had my camera pole with me, I would definitely take a look beneath the surface to see if I can find some fish. But unfortunately, I've left it back at the campsite. Um, but lessons have been learned. Next time I will bring it with me. After a while, the path turned back away from the river past the car park and towards the shallower pools that make up a part of the reserve. Here there are a couple of viewing fences with quite a good view. Of course, there was a little egret here too. It was searching for food the same way the other one had been on the first evening of my trip. I don't know how they have been so successful colonising the country though, as they almost never seem to actually catch anything. Among the lapwings, I could see several Canada geese, with one of them standing out a bit. If you look closely here, you might notice that this bird's wing is not normal. It has a condition called angel wing, which makes the wings, and sometimes the feet, develop abnormally. This usually means that they can't fly, and they can become loners, left behind by their airborne comrades. Happily for this one, that wasn't the case, as there were plenty of other healthy geese on the pool, for now at least. I moved on to the next viewing fence, and from here there was a slightly different assortment of birds. The two gulls here are greater blackback gulls, which can be separated from the more common lesser blackback gulls because of their larger size and their washed out pink legs. There were plenty of other common birds here too, adult cormorants, grey lag geese and black headed gulls in their winter colours. A couple of ever cheeky jackdaws navigated among them along the shore, probably looking for scraps or insects and this trio of birds were doing some synchronised preening. The bird in the middle is a shoveler. Look at the size of her beak. From here, I made a short walk back to the car park, packed my camera away for the final time and headed back to the campsite. And at that point, this mini wildlife adventure comes to an end. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. It's Liam here of the future. Can you hear me? If you enjoyed this style of video, let me know and I'll do my best to make more like it.